note that I wrote is it had a very different what, purpose than, um, than, than on the road with Bob Dylan. I mean, I was a, I, I didn't want access. The last thing I wanted was access. Um, in part because I don't know how to do that. I mean, I don't know how to. I don't, I'm not a journalist. I'm not. You know, um, an oral historian, as they call them, which always sounds vaguely sinister to me, <laughs> or vaguely lewd to me. Um, but I don't know how to do any of that. You know, I don't know how to interview anybody. And I, I, I couldn't do it. And so I'm, I'm a historian. You know, what I do for a living, I've said, uh, I read dead people's mail. <laughs> That's what I do. And so the idea of, of, of actually doing something about a live person that involved talking to the person who was still alive, who could talk back, was frightening. I would never do such a thing, let alone with Bob Dylan. I mean, you know, you know, two minutes with those big blue eyes, and I'd be dead. I, 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 I would have melted. I couldn't have written anything at all objective. Um, I did do a couple of interviews for the book, um, but they were over the phone, they were simple, and they were with, you know, musicians. They were with Al Cooper, basically. And uh, <laughs> that, that, that's fun in itself, but I didn't quite get quite so sucked into all of the ways that I could have done with Bob Dylan. It was a lot of fun talking to them. And to Charlie McCoy is the other one I talked to. Um, so why did I write this, this, this book? Um, you know, aside from wanting to make a little money, which most of the historians don't do when we write about Andrew Jackson. <laughs> um, in part, it, it, both, both Ratso and I grew up in New York at a roughly the same time. Um, um, I, I remember those dollar eighty-eight mono records um, <laughs> very, very well. But we grew up in slightly different um, um, parts of, of the city, and um, I came to Bob Dylan in a different way. And I'm going to read a bit of the introduction, which tells you something about that. I grew up in Brooklyn. Um, yeah. Well, I grew up in Brooklyn Heights, which is an exact <laughs> Brooklyn. <laughs> But I did go to Goodwood High School, so that's in Flatbush and that counts. Um, but while I was growing up, Flatbush, yeah, yeah, yeah. While I was growing up in Brooklyn Heights, my family ran the 8th Street Bookshop in Greenwich Village. Now, you have to have a real place. A place to help nurture the beat poets in the 1950s and the folk revivalists in the early 1960s. My father, Elias Willens, edited the beat scene one of the earliest anthologies of beat poetry. And, uh, you know, you can still find it on ABE Books. It's still out there. Um, you have to pay a pretty penny, and my father didn't live to see any of that, which makes it very sad. Down from the shop on McDougal Street was, the ep was an epicenter of the folk mo music explosion, the Folklore Center, run by my father's friend Israel Young, whom everyone called Izzy, an, outside enth an outsized enthusiast with an impish grin and a heavy, Bronx Jewish accent. Nothing in that setting was anything I had sought out or had any idea was going to become important. As things turned out, I was just lucky. On occasional pleasant Sundays, we'd take family strolls that almost always included a stop at the Folklore Center, which was crowded wall to wall with records and stringed instruments and had a little room in the back where the musicians hung out. My first memories of Bob Dylan or at least of hearing his name or from here. Izzy and my dad would talk about what was happening on the street, and I, a son who wanted to look and act as much as possible like his father, would eavesdrop. Only much later did I learn that Dylan first met Allen Ginsberg late in 1963 in my uncle's apartment above the bookshop. Mm -hmm. um, if you think that Allen Ginsberg wanted to fuck Bob Dylan in 1975, he wanted to fuck him in 1963. <laughs> um, the, the guy who introduced him was a man named Al Aronimus, who was a great, a great figure in our culture. And, um, um, and Al Aronimus heard that there was this party going on, and he thought that Bob Dylan wanted to meet Allen Ginsberg. Allen Ginsberg spent most of the time, from what Al says, um, you know, trying to get inside Bob's pants. Um, which. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that one alone. Um, a few buildings north of Izzy's store, next to the Kettle of Fish Bar, a staircase led down to, into a basement club, where Dylan acquired what it took to make himself a star. The Gaslight Cafe at 116 McDougal was a focal point of the block-long spectacle of hangouts and showcases, including the Cafe Wah, where Dylan played his first shows in the winter of 1961. 
down adjoining tiny Manetta Lane, around the bend on Manetta Street, although you could actually get into it off of McDougal, there was another coffee house, the Commons, later known as the Fat Black Pussycat. These places, along with the Bitter End and Mills Tavern on far more touristy Bleecker Street, and Gertie's Folk City on West 4th Street, were Bob Dylan's Yale College and his Harvard. <laughs> the neighborhood had a distinguished bohemian pedigree, and I'll read this just because the neighborhood is our neighborhood. A century before, over on the corner of Bleecker and Broadway, Walt Whitman loafed in a beer cellar called Faf's, safe from the jibing mainstream critics whom he called Hooters. <coughs> a little earlier, a few blocks up McDougal in a long gone house on Waverly Place, Anne Charlotte Lynch ran a literary salon that hosted Herman Melville and Margaret Fuller, and where a neighbor, Edgar Allan Poe, first read to an audience his poem, The Raven. Eugene O'Neill, Edna St. Vincent Millay, E.E. E. Cummings, Maxwell Bodenheim, and Joe Gould, among others, were 20th century habitués of McDougal Street. And growing up in all of that, those ghosts were very, very much alive. They were very, very present. You knew that you were in the middle of something extraordinary. And, you know, and I'm 10 years younger than Bob Dylan, but, you know, even as a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, you had a feeling, I had a feeling, that something very special was going on. So that's where all of this started. Um, having this, you know, sort of hipster father and family, it was kind of odd, actually. I mean, my father gave me a ticket to a Bob Dylan concert when I was 13 years old. Right? Um, he gave me my first copy of Blonde on Blonde. This is your father. <laughs> it was kind of hard to rebel against that stuff. <laughs> So I did and became a Princeton history professor. <laughs> I showed them. <laughs> uh, 